Well, in the Battle of the Box Tops, it looks as if the first round goes to Boris Badenov, for he has succeeded in dumping thousands of counterfeit box tops on the market, cleaning the premiums out of store after store. As a result, box top savers all over the country are seeing their life savings wiped out as their box tops become worthless. You mean I can't trade these in 25 words or less for an English yo-yo that whistles on the road to Mandalay? Not even with 50 words or less, Grandad. You mean my box tops aren't worth anything? Not a bean, son. There's nothing to trade them for. Gee, eight years old and I'm a ruined man. Yes, things were tough all over, especially in the back room of police headquarters, where Bullwinkle was still being questioned. All right, Moose, are you going to confess or not? Well, I'd like to, fellas, but I promised my dear old mother. Promised her what? That I'd never tell a fib. Okay, Muldoon, put him back in the pokey. But as Bullwinkle headed for a cell, a voice was heard from outside. X3! Box stop bad man strikes again! Stores close and Wicked off falls! Now see what you've done, you monster. But, Chief, Bullwinkle's been in here all the time. So? So how could he be here and in Wichita Falls at the same time? Hmm. You aren't twins, are you? Certainly not. I got enough trouble just being one of me. Now can we go, Chief? Nope. This telegram says I'm supposed to turn you over to the World Economic Council. Economic eggheads, huh? Some of the biggest brains in the world. And they want to see fluff-headed little me? You and your buddy. Come on, Bullwinkle. And while our friends headed for the airport, those foxy four-flushers, Boris Badenov and Natasha Fatal, were busy counting their ill-gotten gains. Let's see. Two warehouses full cowboy hats with real bullet holes. Check, darling. 3,000 sacks of crocheted hubcaps. Check, darling. 197 years supply of dental floss. Check, darling. Oh, boy, Natasha. We're rolling in vital consumer goods. Just wait till I call central control. But as the gleeful Boris was trying to contact his superior, a fast jet was landing at Washington, and Rocky and Bullwinkle were met by a host of reporters and photographers. What are you in town for, sir? I can't see. Why did the World Economic Council call you? I can't see. How long will you be here? I can't see. Why can't you say? Because I don't know. But a short while later, in the office of the World Economic Council, Bullwinkle found out. Mr. Moose, I understand you are the world's largest collector of box stops. Well, yes. Of course, I have quite a few cigar bands, too. Now, with your great knowledge of real box tops, perhaps you can find out just who is making counterfeit box tops and thus ruining world economy. You want me to? You and your friend, Rocket J. Squirrel. But why me, Mr. Blurt? Well, this is the Rocky Show, isn't it? Of course. I keep forgetting. But just then, the door burst open. Mr. Blurt, look here. More bad news? Yeah. Bogus box tops are flooding into Upper Wachikolistan. Upper, Upper Wachikolistan? Where in the world is that? That's just it. It's a tiny little country that nobody knows about. Nobody? Nobody. Except the men in this room. Uh-oh. Gentlemen, one of you is in cahoots with a box top bad man. Well, there's a plot development for you. Which of these men is working hand in glove with Boris Badenov? Don't miss our next exciting episode when a felon needs a friend or pantomime quizzling. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a beautiful but wicked queen. This queen would stand before her mirror for hours, admiring herself. It was a very special kind of mirror. Mirror, mirror, coin machine. Am I still the cutest queen? You're still the best, but wise up fast. Snow White will soon go whizzing past. Snow White? Where can I find her? With dwarfs she dwells, those sawed-off mugs. And by the way, stop using slugs. And the queen got a poison apple to take to Snow White, an apple that would make her the victim of sleeping death. <laughs> 
In a little while, the Queen was approaching the quaint old house of the Seven Dwarfs. It wasn't very difficult to find. Inside the house, a plan was taking shape. Now that's it, boys. Look sharp. This could be a gold mine, a veritable. Well, 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 welcome to the Seven Dwarfs Health Club. Looks like you got it just in time. Build it up, take it off, make it firm. That's what I always say. A sign here for the lifetime membership. Will you do that? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's Snow White? I've got a little something for her. Soon as she eats it, I'll be the fairest in the land. Dear lady, did you know that you could be the fairest in the land forever? Forever? How? The Seven Dwarves Health Club, of course. Seven Dwarves? I see only six. Uh... You sure I could stay the fairest? Come on now, would I kid a queen? The vain queen was so desperate to stay the fairest that she signed the contract and gave her crown as payment. Then, one day, several weeks later... Mirror, mirror, put me straight. Snow White or me, now who's first rate? Good kid you are and rather sweet. But Snow White's the one, she's got you beat. Oh! So, once again, the queen got a poison apple and went to the seven dwarfs' house to find Snow White. But this time, the dwarfs had a brand new enterprise. Welcome. Welcome to the seven dwarfs' dance studio. Walk in, samba out. Never mind that. Is Snow White here? And one, two, three, and one, two, three. Cut that out. Where's Snow White? Never heard of her. Put a little fun in your life. Try dancing. Who's this big guy? I thought you were all dwarfs. Please, lady, shh. Quiet. He's got glam trouble. It's nothing to laugh at. Now, this is for a lifetime membership to the dance club. Sure enough, this time the queen traded all her jewels to the dwarfs. And some weeks later... Mirror, mirror, one, two, three. Is there one as fair as me? Fair at what? Not dancing, pray. Snow White now leads in every way. The queen was clearly slipping fast. All right. Where's Snow White? Will you look at that posture? That hair. Oh, my dear, those claws. No good. If you want to be the fairest in the land, you'll need a lifetime membership. The Seven Dwarfs Charm School. Fairest in the land, eh? How much? At this time, the queen gave the deed to her castle to the dwarfs. So when she returned home, it was to an empty lot. Mirror, mirror on... I know, I know. Snow White at the dwarfs' place. In that order. Listen, Wiseacre. Snow White isn't at the dwarf's place where you keep sending me. With dwarf she dwells and... All right, I'll show you. See, no Snow White here. Just dwarfs. Oh, will you look at that poor woman? A B1 deficiency. Now, how could you ever hope to be the fairest with improper diet? Improper diet? No, not meats. No yogurt. No wheat jam. But I have nothing left to pay for anything. You need the Seven Dwarfs health food plan. Do you what? Just this mirror. That's all I have left. That's all? Okay, we'll take it. Here, and your health food plan starts with eating these poison... these apples. So the Wicked Queen wound up with nothing but her own poison apples. But suddenly... Pardon me, do you have a pay mirror I can use? Right over there. Is it a local... Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Snow White is the fairest one, but getting there is half the fun. Oh, goody, goody, goody. That's me. I'm Snow White. No, there really is a Snow White. Get ready, boys, another pigeon. And if you want to stay the fairest, you'll need a lifetime membership in the Seven Dwarfs Health Club. Seven Dwarfs? I see only six. Isn't there a seventh one? Well, certainly there is. Meet Max. He has the most important job in our whole operation. Yeah. And boy, it's stuffy in there. Sir, with a message. Just in time. Is it important? Is it? Just look. Time now for the biggest thinker of them all, Mr. Know-it-all. Hello, America. Today's mental fire drill comes under the heading of how to be a cow puncher without getting hit back. The simplest way of learning how to punch cows is to join a cattle drive. 
The person who does the hiring is called a five man, which is a four man who got promoted. You with the built in chaps. It's Betty by time for kettle. You stand guard. You got gun? Sure, right here. Tell me, why you got hot water bottle on gun? <laughs> it's a sick shooter. Not feeling good, huh? Does it shoot? Does it shoot? <laughs> Now look what you done, kettle has stampeding! Never fear, I shall stop them! How do you stop 5,000 fear-crazed beasts? By holding up five fear-crazed fingers and saying, Whoa! <coughs> That's very good! How do you get them started again? Oh, by saying, giddy up. After serving his apprenticeship, the full-fledged cowboy now puts his knowledge to use by joining a rodeo, or radio, they're both correct. And the winner of the Bronco Busting event is Mr. Know-It-All. Golly, Mr. Know-It-All, you sure can ride. Yeah, you're only supposed to stay on ten seconds. I've been on this critter ten hours. How do you manage to stay on him so long? Very simple. I got a pocket full of dimes. <laughs> Again, Peabody, Sherman, and Sherman here. Two Shermans, Mr. Peabody? Two Shermans, Sherman. Yourself and the gentleman who made the historic march from Atlanta to the sea, General William Tecumseh Sherman. The time? November 1864. And the place? A dusty road in Georgia. The Wayback Machine responded beautifully, and in no time at all, Sherman and I were standing in line with 70,000 Union soldiers. This is downright disgraceful. Trouble, General? You bet there's trouble, Sonny. I gotta get to the sea. The Albacore are running. What's preventing you from marching, General? That pesky bridge over there. It's a toll bridge, and the varmint is charging a nickel a man to cross. 70,000 soldiers at five cents a man? $3,500, Sherman. Sorry, mister, but no one crosses without paying me a nickel. Of course, that's today. Tomorrow's different. Different? In what way? Why, it's free bridge day in Georgia. You can cross any bridge you want for nothing. Oh, then General Sherman can cross tomorrow. That's right, Sonny. He sure can. Sherman could hardly wait to relay the news. However, I insisted we stay near the bridge until the sun went down. But why, Mr. Peabody? Because, Sherman, free bridge day didn't begin in Georgia until after the Civil War. That toll guard is a spy. Under cover of the darkness, we made our way to the very middle of the structure, and there my suspicions were confirmed. <laughs> By the time I'm through, this bridge will never hold 70,000 men. Sherman will reach the sea all right, but he'll be floating, not marching. You are right, Mr. Peabody. I'm always right, Sherman. Now, we'll inform the general of this. Oh, and be careful where you step. The toll guard has removed one or two planks. Unfortunately, my warning was issued a fraction too late, for Sherman was already en route to a first-hand view of the river. The swift current carried him downstream while I raced along the shoreline, waiting for an opportunity to effect a rescue. At a point where the river narrowed, I came across an outdoor performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin. The audience sat enthralled, watching the drama unfold. It was Act Three, where little Eva was being across a line of simulated ice flows. On she came, followed by a pack of hounds, followed by Simon Legree, who in turn was followed by me. I plucked Sherman from the river and thereby gave this performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin an unusual finish. Thanks, Mr. Peabody. You're welcome, Sherman. And now let us return to the bridge. General Sherman must be warned before he attempts to cross. Free bridge day? That's right, General. You and your men can go over without paying me one red cent. That's mighty generous of you. I know, but it'll give me a good feeling to know that I sent you on your way. Just a moment, General. Oh, it's you two. You heard the good news? We heard. But before you cross the bridge, I should like to make a slight alteration. Uh, there ain't nothing wrong with my bridge. I didn't say there was. And so, with 70,000 men looking on, I made a careful survey of the sabotaged structure. Now, do you have a piece of string on you, Sherman? 
Will this do? I think so. With the string, I secured two small sections of the bridge. All right, General. You may cross now. To the toll guard's dismay, General Sherman, at his entire command, crossed the river without so much as a quiver from the bridge. From the opposite shore, we watched the shocked spy examine my handiwork. Uh, what happened? This bridge should have collapsed into the river. Simply superb structural engineering, my good man. Merely a perfect example of distribution of weight. I don't believe it. So saying, he untied the string, and as day broke, so did the bridge. My deepest appreciation for your help, Mr. Peabody, and please accept these. A fishbowl for each of us. Yes, my hobby is constructing small fish tanks. Well, on to the albacore. Hmm, that's very interesting. I didn't think these became popular until World War II. What became popular, Mr. Peabody? Tanks, my boy. Sherman tanks. Last time you remember, Rocky dropped a bombshell under the meeting of the World Economic Council when he told its members... Gentlemen, one of you is in cahoots with a box-top bad man. Impossible. I think he's right. Was his cahoots? Look, if phony box-tops are showing up in what you call us, Dan... And they are. And if nobody even knows where it is except you people... And they don't. Then, ergo, one of you must be sending the counterfeit box-tops there. Brilliant deduction. Magnifique. What a brain. And he's my buddy. We must find out which one of us it is. And I know just the man to do the job. Who's that? Our chief security officer. Call him quickly. Calling Inspector Soames. Inspector Hemlock Soames. Come in, please. Come in. I am in. You're the chief security officer? Hemlock Soames at your service. Your crime is my crime. Allow me to introduce my English assistant, Dr. Watkins. Cheerio, y'all. She's English? From the south of England. You know, way down yonder in Newton Abbott. Oh, of course. Now, what's up, gentlemen? Mr. Squirrel thinks that someone in our group is in league with the box top Batman. <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy there. Oh, thanks, old chappy, darling. Elementary, my dear Watkins. And I'll bet whoever it is has his counterfeit box tops hidden right in this building, too. In this building? <laughs> Impossible. But, darling... Cheer up, Dr. Watkins. I think we ought to search the whole building. Well, if you insist... I do insist. Okay, let's go. Do you think you can find the culprit, Inspector Soames? Buddy, if I can't find him, who can? Well, the squirrel has done it again, Boris. Duh. How could such a little nebbish have such a big mouth? The search party looked high and low through the building without finding a thing. For an hour, they searched and finally found themselves on the top floor of the building. Okay, last floor. You chaps search in there, we search in here. Right. Boris, what are you doing? Look. Boris, you send him into the clock tower. Sure enough, our friends found themselves in a musty room full of huge clockwork wheels and gears. Ouch! I feel like an ant in a wristwatch. Yeah, we're lucky these gears are moving so slow. They'd be pretty dangerous. But Rocky had reckoned without the fiendish mind of Hemlock Soames, alias Boris Badenov. For at that moment, the villain was smashing the mechanism that controlled the speed of the huge clock. Listen, Natasha, the clock is gaining. It was true. Without their controlling mechanism, the huge gears turned faster and faster. Look at these gears go, Bullwinkle. Yeah, how time flies when you're having fun. Something's gone wrong, Bullwinkle. The controls must have broken. Yeah, I figure we gained about a week and a half already. We better get out of here. I'm with you, Rock. Hey! Let me in it, Rock! I'll bust it open! Bullwinkle threw himself at the door, but it held fast, and the mighty moose tottered backward. Look out, Bullwinkle! 
Too late, for Bullwinkle had disappeared into a whirling mass of machinery. Don't miss our next exciting episode. Give them the works. Or rock around the clock. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop.